We frequently use Enet for viewing and sharing highly confidential and personal information, online banking records, medical reports, credit scores, among many other things. When we access a website or communicate with someone over the internet, how can we be sure who we're communicating with and not someone or something more malicious? We use protocols like TLS, Transport Layer Security, to secure the connection between our browsers and the server. But that secure connection only helps us if we know who we're actually communicating with. So how can we be sure who we're actually communicating with across the internet? Hi, I'm Rob Witcher. In today's episode, we're going to talk about digital certificates and how they help us solve this problem by binding an owner to their public key. Let's begin by understanding the problem the digital certificates address. We'll look at an example here of Alice accessing her online banking. In order to secure the communications between her browser and the server, she'll use a protocol like TLS, which will encrypt the data in motion between her browser and the server. The first step in establishing a secure TLS session is Alice's browser sending a client hello message to the server. The server replies with a server hello message and includes a copy of the server's asymmetric public key. Alice's browser receives the server's public key. And here's the cool part about TLS. Alice's browser actually generates a symmetric session key that they use for encrypting the communication between the server. But now we have the big problem of symmetric key distribution. To solve this problem, Alice's browser encrypts the symmetric key with the server's public key and thus the only system in the world that can decipher the symmetric session key is the server with its private key. So Alice's browser sends the encrypted session key over to the server and the server decrypts with its private key. The server now has a copy of the symmetric session key and it seems like no one could have gotten a copy of the symmetric key in transit. And because both Alice's browser and the server have the same symmetric key on both sides, they can now switch over to very fast, very efficient symmetric cryptography. This seems great, but there's actually a huge problem here, and it has to do with the server sending its public key to Alice. Public keys are never sent like this. And to be clear, this is not how protocols like TLS work. Let's understand why you never just send a public key like this. Here's the same diagram again, and let's start from the beginning. Alice's browser sends a client hello message, the server replies with a server hello message, and sends a copy of the server's public key. But now we introduce our third actor, the baddie, performing a man-in-the-middle attack. The baddie intercepts the server's public key. And rather than forwarding on the server's public key to Alice, the baddie forwards on the baddie's public key. Not good. Alice receives what she thinks is the server's public key, but is in fact the baddie's public key. And as before, her browser then proceeds to generate a symmetric session key and encrypt this session key with what her browser thinks is the server's public key, but is in fact the baddie's public key. And then Alice's browser sends that encrypted ciphertext to the server. Predictably, the baddie intercepts the encrypted symmetric session key. And because it was encrypted with the baddie's public key, it is decrypted with the baddie's private key. So the baddie now has a copy of the symmetric session key. Not good at all. Further, our baddie, being the nefarious individual that they are, proceeds to re-encrypt that symmetric session key with the server's public key and forward that ciphertext onto the server. The server decrypts the encrypted symmetric key with the server's private key. And now the server has a copy of the symmetric key and Alice has a copy of the symmetric key, and they begin communicating back and forth using this symmetric key, thinking this is a secure connection. But it is not, because who else has the symmetric key? The baddie. Now, just like the first time around, Alice and the server both have the same symmetric key and begin communicating back and forth using fast and secure symmetric encryption. The big difference here, of course, is that this encrypted session is not secure. The baddie has a copy of the symmetric key. With the symmetric key, the baddie is able to easily decrypt, read, and even modify data before encrypting it and passing it on. And neither Alice nor the server have any idea this is happening. Why don't they know the baddie is doing this? The problem here resides with the exchange of public keys. What is a public key? At the most basic level, a public key is just a string of numbers bits, ones and zeros. There is no way to tell if some bunch of ones and zeros belongs to the server or to the baddie. 
How then do we fix this problem? The answer is digital certificates. Digital certificates bind an owner to their public key. They allow us to verify who a public key belongs to. To understand how, let's look at the process we use to create a digital certificate. We'll use Alice as an example. She wants to obtain a digital certificate that anyone in the world would trust. She begins by providing a little bit of information on herself, including her name and a copy of her public key to a trusted certificate authority. If she wants anyone in the world to trust her digital certificate, then she needs to go to one of the big trusted CAs, such as Komodo, Symantec, GoDaddy, GlobalSign, DigiCert, any of these ones. I always think uh, GoDaddy is Big Daddy, but that's an entirely different type of video. So Alice submits some information on herself and a copy of her public key to a trusted CA. The first thing the CA does is proof her identity and verify her info. In other words, if Alice says she is Alice, the CA will confirm that she is in fact Alice. We call this identity proofing. And to go a step deeper, the entity that does the identity proofing is often referred to as the registration authority, the RA. Once Alice's identity has been proofed, the CA encrypts the information she provided along with her public key with the CA's private key. And that's it. Oversimplified, a digital certificate contains the name of the owner and a copy of their public key, all of which is encrypted with the CA's private key. So who can decrypt a digital certificate from one of the big trusted certificate authorities? The answer is anyone with the CA's public key. This is why if you want anyone in the world to trust your digital certificate, you have to go to one of the big global trusted CAs because everyone in the world has a copy of the big public CA's keys installed on their systems. How does everyone have the big CA's public keys installed on their systems? Well, they come pre-installed with our browsers, with our operating systems. So you can assume that everyone in the world has the big CA's public keys. By the way, the standard by which we create digital certificates is known as X509. I'll be making a video on X509 and uh, I'll link to that up here when, uh, when I get a chance to make it. Okay, now that we understand what a digital certificate is and what they contain, let's understand how they help us solve this man in the middle problem that we've just discussed. The crux of it is that we never ever send someone our public key. Instead, we send them our digital certificate. Let's take a look. The server needs to get its public key to Alice, but rather than just sending its public key, the server sends its digital certificate. Our baddie will, as usual, intercept the communication and now has a copy of the server's digital certificate. The baddie can forward on its own digital certificate instead of the server's, but let's look at what happens. Alice receives the baddie's digital certificate and the first thing she's going to do is decrypt with the CA's public key. What she finds inside the digital certificate is that it belongs to the baddie. Because remember, digital certificates contain the name of the owner of that digital certificate. Alice's browser was expecting a certificate from the bank's server. So right away, her browser knows that it shouldn't trust the public key contained within the digital certificate from the baddie. Her browser will report to Alice that this is an invalid certificate, and her browser will not proceed with generating a symmetric key and encrypting with the baddie's public key. The man in the middle attack has been solved because Alice is able to verify the owner of a public key. Now, you might be wondering about another crafty thing the baddie could try. The baddie can intercept the server's digital certificate, and the baddie can certainly decrypt it to get the server's public key. Because like everyone else in the world, the baddie has a copy of the CA's public key. The interesting question though is, can the baddie remove the server's public key from the server's digital certificate and replace it with the baddie's own public key? The answer is an emphatic no. For the baddie to be able to modify or to recreate this certificate, the baddie would need the CA's private key. And you can be darn sure the big trusted CAs do a very good job of protecting their private keys. So there you have it. Digital certificates bind an owner to their public key, allowing us to verify who we're communicating with over the internet. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you found this episode informative. If you like this video, you can hit the like button. And if you want to be notified when we release future videos, you can hit the subscribe and the bell icon. Let me know what you think in the comments down below and let me know what topics you want me to cover in the future. Cheers.